I want to invite you to turn your Bibles this morning to Luke chapter 2. We're going to go, I guess you would call it into Christmas mode. Um, although Christmas mode should be year-round, we have something to celebrate about the birth of Christ throughout the calendar, not just this time in December. But as we look to this time, sometimes the pressures and the activities of what goes on all around us can take some of the joy away, and in a matter of a few hours, much of life can change, as we saw Friday evening. Many on Friday evening or night had their priorities changed rather quickly due to the storm that came through, but in our own lives, sometimes our priorities change quickly in the matter of a phone call or an announcement or something along that line. As we think about this time of Christmas, though, some miss this important event because we have become so distracted by other things. Some can even miss the miracle of Christmas because they refuse to allow their priorities to be changed. As we read from Luke chapter 2, starting in verse 1, I want us to take a look at some people that, that missed the miracle of Jesus being born because they were focused on what they thought was the most important item for them. And yet, by focusing on that and not seeing the birth of Christ, they missed the most important time, the most important event could have, that could have ever happened, or that did happen. So read with me out of verse 1 of Luke chapter 2. Stand, if you will, as we read our text together. Verse 1, Luke chapter 2 says, In those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration from Quirinius, was governor of Syria, and all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and the lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you today thanking you for this event that we're able to read about today. Because of this, we can actually have this time of prayer directly to you through your Son. And so, Lord, we're thankful for what He done for us and what He will do for us. And Lord, today we just pray that through Your Word, our hearts would be challenged to be the individual that You've called us to be, but Lord, also to, to realize that we need not be distracted from what You are doing in our life, and maybe even in the lives of others. So help us to remain clear upon Your calling upon our life, but Lord, also your guidance upon our life. Help us to be obedient to it. We pray it in your Son's name, Jesus the Christ. Amen. You may be seated. We titled this morning's sermon, Can We Miss Christmas? Now, we're going to go through the days, we're going to go through the motions, but can we actually miss Christmas? We are not told much about this innkeeper that we read about in verse 7 of our text. There's no follow-up story that comes later in Luke or in any other portion of the Bible that tells us about what happened or what this innkeeper done. There's no documentary, there's no mini-series out there that you can watch about the innkeeper that's factual anyway. We are left to wonder what happened. And if we were to flash ahead 35 years, ballpark of 30 to 35 years, from this moment in time, and if we were to think and assume that the innkeeper was still alive and that he had kept track of Jesus, this Christ child that was born in Bethlehem, and yet he was the guy that had to say, there's no room for you in the inn. We wonder what his thought would have been 35 years later, 30 years later, as he sees him go to the cross, as he sees him prior to that doing miracles, stating the claims and the truths we know to be, saying that he was the Son of God, and yet he had the opportunity to house him in his 
own inn. But he had no room, or at least that's what we are told here, that he has no room. You wonder what stories he might have told his grandchildren. I was the one that did not give a place to stay for the Son of God. That'd be a great story for your grandchildren to pass on to their kids, right? But I wonder if that's the story that we do pass on, even today. When we think about our life and we think about how busy we become, is that a story that we live out today? That we have no room in our heart for Christ? And do we communicate that to the following generations? That we have room for everything else. We have room for the, the parties. We have room for the, the events that go on around Christmas. We have room for the Christmas shopping. We have room for the lights. We have room for you name it. But we don't have room for Christ. When we think about this inn or this innkeeper we realize the statement he makes there in verse 7, or the statement that's recorded for us, there is no room or was no room for them in the end. This small sentence carries such a big message to us today. And it's not just about the end that was there some 2,000 years ago. It was not that they did not try to get into the inn, to have a normal place to sleep or to, a place for Mary to be comfortable. It was that they did not have the opportunity to be in a house. It was not like today we think about where there was a separate room and, and your own bathroom when you went and you stayed in an inn. It was very much someone's home that they had somewhat had some extra room. And so in this period of time, what we understand from the history that we have is that there would have been people sleeping everywhere within the inn. They would not have been confined just to a room, probably would have been sleeping in the hallways of the home if there was hallways, would have been sleeping in a living area if they had a living area. But they would have housed people, not just the number of people that they had bedrooms for, especially with this large of a group of people having to travel in. It was a time people traveling to Bethlehem and People would have been afforded the opportunity to sleep in someone else's home, even if it was on the floor next to someone else that you maybe didn't even know. So there had to be a reason that this innkeeper, or maybe possibly many different innkeepers, would have said, there is no room. Now we would assume that Mary's condition would have been somewhat obvious to anyone that she would have been in front of. Now, we always kind of have this thought that like they arrived on a day and then that night she gave birth. We don't know if that's true or not. We know that, that she arrived, they arrived in Bethlehem, and it was a short period of time, but we don't really know the number of days necessarily until she gave birth, but it would have been a short period of time. But no matter if it was a day or two or a week, Mary's condition would have been obvious which leads us to only speculate again as to why they were not given a place in the innkeeper's home. Could it have been that he thought that it would be bad business to have a woman giving birth in close quarters around other guests that might have detracted from the number of people that would stay in his inn, and therefore he would not have made the income that he made? Could it have thought that many would have been upset if she gave birth and they were trying to rest and therefore they would not want to pay. We don't know the reason necessarily. We always assume, as it says, there's no room for them in the end. We assume that that's literal, no room. We don't know the motives, though, behind why there were no room except God had a plan. But it could be that these innkeepers in all of God's plan were distracted by the things of the world. And because they were distracted by the things of the world, maybe it was finances, maybe it was just not wanting to have this event happen in their home. 
Whatever it may have been, if they were distracted by the things of the world, then they missed the greatest opportunity an innkeeper could ever have. And that would be to say that the Savior of the world was born in your home. Now, could you imagine if he would have made room for them in the inn? Could you imagine what a tourist attraction this would have become later on? Especially if there was some of the people like today that lived back in that time. They would have had the neon signs flash and see where Christ was born, here. Of course, it didn't happen. But whatever this innkeepers, or maybe even multiple innkeepers, motives were, they missed the miraculous entrance of God in human form to this earth. And I would ask you today, do we become just as distracted as this innkeeper may have become? Some of you may be familiar with a, a movie that is shown on TV somewhere around this time of year. It's titled, I believe, Christmas with the Cranks is the title of it. If you've ever seen the movie, it's somewhat comical how a family is portrayed in the time around Christmas. The daughter has moved away and said she was not going to come home for Christmas, so the family decides, the mom and dad decide, that they are going to actually celebrate Christmas by going on a, I believe it's a cruise or a vacation anyway. And then suddenly the daughter, the last minute, the daughter decides she's coming home. Now they didn't decorate, they didn't put anything out. People in the neighborhood were giving them a hard time because they were not following the tradition of decorating like the neighborhood did. And then there was this mad dash to do everything that they should have done over the last few weeks in a matter of a few hours. And there was this one thing that they had to find. It was some type of a honey baked ham or something. It was the ham in the metal tin. I remember that part of it. I think he even gets arrested maybe for that because he was trying to get one. But they had become distracted. If you think about just the movie as a whole, they had become distracted by outside influences during the Christmas season, had forgotten why we even have this time of year that we celebrate as Christmas. And they were just interested in going on a vacation. In reality, it's not really a season at all as we think about. We sometimes call it that. A season implies a beginning and an end. But this Christmas time of year, it's not a time that we should be, or it is a time we should be reminded of what should be celebra celebrated year round in our heart and our life. If you remember the most common verse memorized, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. That eternal life was not just during the month of December. But when we think about calling it a season, think about some of the other things that we call seasons. There's football season, there's hunting season, there's baseball season, there's basketball season, there's spring, the spring season, autumn, fall. All of those things have a beginning and they all have an end. Season can be defined as one of the four periods into which the year is commonly divided, or it can be defined as a period of time when a particular sport is being played, again with a period of time having a start date and an end date. But you see, there really should be no start and end date to celebrating the Savior of the world coming into the earth to be sacrificed so that you and I could have forgiveness of our sins. There should not be a Christmas season. There should be Christmas year-round because Christ came so that we would be saved, not just in December and not just so we would celebrate His birth in December, but so we would have a heart that was thankful year-round for God sending His Son into this world because He loved it so much so that we could have eternal life with Him. Now, I'm not saying that the decorations and the songs that we hear around this time of year, that things such as White Christmas and Jingle Bells and Rocking Around the Christmas. I'm not saying those things should be played year-round. That's not what I'm saying. 
Not saying you should have a Christmas tree in your house year-round. If you want to, that's your business. And if y'all tell Jennifer I said it was okay, <laughs> you're going to get a different sermon next Sunday, I'm just telling you. I'm already going to crop part of this service, but very crop when you said Christmas could be year-round. <laughs> you may need to look for another job tomorrow. <laughs> I am saying, though, that the birth of the Savior should be acknowledged and recognized and thanksgiving should be shown year-round. Why would we confine the celebration of the season of the Savior of the world? Why would we confine that to a season that has a start date and an end date? Could it be because we have missed Christmas altogether? Could it be that the distractions around the true meaning of what Christmas should be all about have taken our attention off what it should be about, and we've missed what's really important? As you exchange gifts or give gifts to someone, do you think in your heart of the wise men that brought gifts to the baby Jesus and what they represented? Which, by the way, the wise men did not come on that night. They came later. So if you'd like to acknowledge what they did at a more appropriate time, this giving of gifts, my birthday's in March, if you'd like to think about that. But seriously, we may sing the songs, but do we even really mean what we sing? Think about this song, Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. I think that's the name of it. No, I'm sorry. Thou didst leave my, thy throne and thy kingly crown. Part of that song actually says, Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. There is room in my heart for thee. But do we make room for Christ during this time we say, is the Christmas season. The time that we set aside to acknowledge and celebrate His birth, do we really make room for it, or do we just sing the song, Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. There's room in my heart for you. But as soon as I deal with all these other things, there'll be room for you there. Just as maybe the innkeeper was distracted by what really should have been offered or provided for this young couple that needed a place to stay, maybe we're distracted by all that goes on this time of year. We forget to celebrate because a Savior came into the world, not just this time of year, but He came into the world so that all might be saved at any point in time that they would call upon the name of Christ. Do we forget that? There's a song that we sang just a few moments ago, the first Noel. Do you know what Noel means? It actually means the announcement of the birth. The first announcement of the birth came to the shepherds. Turn to Luke chapter 2, verse 8. Just pick up where we left off reading. And we find this first Noel, and, and in the same region there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day. In the city of David, a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly, there were shoppers all over the place in the malls, buying gifts. Suddenly, there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest. And on earth, peace among those with whom he is pleased. 
Do we shout that from the mountaintop this time of year? You ever walk by somebody and instead of saying Merry Christmas, you say glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among us? We don't, right? Anybody ever said that? I don't want to make a false statement here. We don't. We imply through Merry Christmas as a Christian that that's what we're meaning, right? That we're happy that Christ came. But I want you to think about in the world we live in today, do people understand when we say Merry Christmas that that's what we're talking about? Probably not. Maybe it's time that we do what the angels did. Glory to God in the highest. If you read on, verse 15, it says, When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning the child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. They didn't rejoice at the gift that they got. Actually, they did, but it was the Savior of the world, not a gift that they opened. They rejoiced because a Savior had come into the world. We can ask all kinds of questions about why announce the birth to shepherds. You've heard probably me or others talk about that the shepherds were really in society. They were of least importance. They were looked down upon. They were not considered valuable. Their testimony in court wasn't typically even heard. By human standards, they were the least likely candidates to first hear about the Messiah's birth. But the first Noel, the first announcement came to the shepherds. Why didn't the angels make the announcements to some of the most important religious leaders in Israel? The people that were supposed to be leading the people. Why not go to them? Why did the first Noel not go to the priest? Could it possibly be that they were too busy? Could it possibly be that their mind was on other things, not the coming of the Messiah into the world? Could they have been distracted by their political expectations or their political aspirations of what they would become at some point in time? Could it be that they were distracted about just living life? Maybe they were eating, drinking, and just being merry. Whatever it was, from what we can see and understand, they were so distracted that they not only missed the birth, but they also missed the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You think about it, they didn't just miss the birth, they missed it all the way through. But we have people today that are doing the exact same thing. They're missing the birth, they're missing the life, they're missing the death, and they're missing the resurrection of Jesus Christ and what it means to them in their life. Are we distracted today? Do we miss Christmas today because of maybe some of our rigid expectations that blind us to what God is doing in our lives? Because we have... We have the plan for our life, don't we? I can remember as a, a teenager, you know, that time when you're getting close to your senior year or either you're in your senior year, maybe first year of college, and you're charting the course for your life. And you think you have it all figured out. You know what you're going to do. And then you, know, then you have kids, and you think, I know exactly what my kids are going to do because it's my choice what they do, right? And you have this 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 course planned out of what they're going to do. Maybe even you break it down to even Christmas. 
And we have this thought of what we're going to be doing Christmas Eve or Christmas Day. And I can tell you that there are people in Monette today that are not going to be doing what they plan to do. And if God was so to decide to send His Son back to the earth between now and Christmas, all those plans that we would have made would mean nothing. Unless you've made the one plan of Jesus Christ being your Savior. Have you become distracted from that in your life today? Maybe the endeavors of, of living life and earning money and being financially stable or, or having a career in a job or finishing school or whatever it may be, maybe those things have blinded you. Maybe just the enjoyment of family. Maybe you've got to the point where you have grandkids, you just want to spend time with them, right? Because they're fun and they're innocent and they do no wrong. Maybe all the while, God is calling upon your life. And maybe you've been saved, but He's still calling upon your life for something. But we've let the world distract us from that. Maybe you've been saved, but, but maybe you've, you've got to a point where you just kind of, your relationship with God is not where it needs to be. Because there's been so many distractions in the world. Several years ago, we had had a, a, a youth uh, association event uh, in Walnut Ridge, and it's when I was in Jonesboro as pastor, and, and I was speaking at it that night, and, and we decided to speak on distractions, and so I'd, I had a service, I'd had someone plan. For their cell phone to go off during while I was speaking. And I had someone at the back that, that actually knocked a book off a ledge and so it made a huge noise. And we had someone that I forgot what the other one was. We had three different things that just were distractions in the service, in the time that we were speaking. And you know what everyone did every time one of those happened? Do you think they listened to what I was saying more intently? Do you think they listen to God more intently? But no, they do the same thing that we do every day in our life. When God speaks and something else happens, they've done the exact same thing that we do every day when we're out in the world and God's speaking to us, but something else happens. And you know where they turned? It wasn't to God, but they turned to what the distraction was. I get it. And we have to learn to live because distractions happen in our life every day. And if we don't learn to live with them, then we're never going to be able to focus on God. We've got to get to a point where distractions don't bother us. But what we hear is the voice of God in our life. What we follow is the voice of God in our life. What we are committed to do is what the voice of God tells us to do in our life. And whatever happens around us, we realize this world's only temporary, and one day Christ is returning. If you were in Sunday school this morning, if you got to that part of it, you got to read Revelation 21, you know, the first four verses, and you see what happens when the kingdom of God comes. There'll be no more sorrow, no more tears, no more pain. For the former things of life will, be, will pass away, and we will dwell among God, and God will dwell among us if we are a believer in Jesus Christ. Are we distracted from the miracle that happened that we celebrate here at the end of the year? Are we distracted from the, this miracle that we celebrate at the end of the year that actually means that we have the opportunity for eternal life? Now, I know the crucifixion, the resurrection had to happen. I understand, but you know what it started with, right? Christ coming into this world because God loved it so much and loved you so much. We enjoy the time of getting together with family, friends, 
But I would ask you, do you love these family and friends enough to fight through the distractions and to do unto them what the angels did to the shepherds and deliver the announcement of the birth of Jesus Christ? You see, it's great that we have the times to get together with family and friends. I enjoy it just as much as, as any of you probably do. I don't have grandkids, so I don't have that experience yet. Hint, hint. <laughs> just kidding. <clears throat> Some of you get to, you've, you've got, you're in your time right now where you're experiencing grandkids in the, in the Christmas time with grandkids, right? Some of you still have young kids and you're experiencing Christmas time with kids and there's such an excitement around that, isn't there? But are we teaching them to be excited about the right thing? You know, I fully believe that when the wise men showed up, however long it was later, some believe it's up to about three years later, however long it was, whatever time period it was, I fully believe that those wise men were so excited to be there. And were they receiving a gift? Were they exchanging gifts? Not physically necessarily, right? They did receive a gift. Savior of the world. But do we become excited just because we do a gift exchange? Or do we become excited because we have the opportunity to say, glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace among those with whom He is pleased? Because that's what the angels told the shepherds that day. It was the first announcement of the birth. Do we get excited to say that? To live that? Or do we become so distracted that we can't even find it within ourselves to share the gospel with those that we love the most? Or we say we love the most? Because if we really do, then they've got to hear about Jesus Christ. This morning as you stand to your feet, I would ask you as we, musicians go ahead and make their way, as we think about all that will happen over the next few weeks, and I know some of you will be running place to place, will we remember what this is really about? Will we remember that we can say glory to God in the highest? And on earth, peace among those with whom He is pleased. Will we remember that or will we just remember happy holidays? Will we remember that there's people that need to hear about Jesus Christ because they need to hear that there is a possibility, a way, an absolute way for them to have forgiveness of their sins and them to have eternal life through Jesus Christ. Will we remember that that message is what they need to hear? Even this time of year? Or will we become so involved in all the activities that go on that we are distracted from what this time is even about? As you pray with me this morning, dear Heavenly Father, we do come to you at this time. Lord, we pray that as we bring this service to a close that, Lord, you would have your way even in this time and that we would be obedient to that. And Lord, maybe there be there is one here today that that is needing to get their relationship with you right because they've let the distractions just pull them away so far that they don't even hear you in their life anymore. Maybe they've never established that relationship with you to the point that, that they need to say and ask your son, Jesus Christ, to be their Savior. Maybe today God's called them to take a step forward in their life from where they are. But maybe there's been so many distractions in their life that they don't even know what that step is. God, we ask that you be clear with them today. Lord, in your time, that you would show them. But Lord, that they would just be willing.
that they would be willing and they would know that they can trust you with their life. That they can trust the one that gave up his kingly dwelling in your presence and came to this earth to live among those who walk in sin, to be treated terribly among or by some, and Lord, to die for all so that they might have the opportunity to dwell with you one day. Lord, help us to realize that that he can be trusted, your son can be trusted. And help us to remember that this time of year is all about trusting in him. So Lord, if there's one that needs to come and pray today, we pray that today they would be obedient to you. And we pray these things in your son's name, Jesus the Christ. Amen. As we sing a verse.